So now you will be able to uh, see my screen and uh, we will start with the first panel discussions. So in this session, we'll discuss taxpayers' rights and we will both uh, talk about tax policy and the tax technology and how this impacts taxpayers' rights. And uh, I'd like to invite Steve and Hans to give their opening statements on this. You first, Dave. Yeah, welcome everyone. Um, what what uh, Hans and, and Luana and me have been discussing is is uh, the quite obvious uh, uh, follow through after BAPS of uh, Pillar One and Pillar Two. So the the following uh, video or Snapchats of the video will show you some highlight highlights of the taped um, uh, session where we, we had an interesting dialogue with uh, various people and in the meantime on how uh, uh, tax authorities uh, do believe uh, amongst themselves uh, in most uh, occasions that pillar one and pillar two will really close the gap uh, between what BAPS has achieved and, and what uh, BAPS has not achieved uh, to be com complemented by pillar one and pillar two. Um, I, I think we, we see a lot of movement at the level of governments. We see a lot of silence at the level of corporates, at least uh, from, from at first glance uh, on, on these matters. I think exactly as Hans indicates, because it, it seems to be a game amongst governments right now and not a game where uh, as we, we have uh, almost reached a hundred years of um, uh, from the, the, the League of Nations uh, onwards uh, of building consensus. And, and our biggest question, we've, uh, one of the biggest questions we've been addressing, uh, did uh, the OECD in particular, but also the, the whole dialogue around the aftermath of BAPS uh, on pillar one and two, did that throw the consensus model out of the window to get to an, uh, a tax authority's position first before taking the other stakeholders on the on the social contract, the NGOs, the citizens, and the corporates on board again. Um, that's it's it's a very interesting breakaway um, from from the old days and the old days uh, being in place for a hundred years. And uh, yeah, we are very curious also to hear some views from uh, from the audience on that. Hans. Uh, I think nothing to add. Um, the war, I should describe it, the position of the states, that's, 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 that's getting a main issue. And uh, the point is that by the fact that many states see all these developments as a possibility to act in a way as they didn't act before because they have the support of the people, um, there won't be an agreement on the current pending uh, so, yeah, call it solutions or proposals from the OCD. And that is as a consequence that many states go on their own. And that is going to be a war outside. I think uh, that we can go to the uh, snapshots, uh, Steve. All right, so we'll go ahead and now uh, we have a uh, first video that I would like to show to everyone that's um, regarding Luan's participation in the interview session. Just let me know if you, if you can hear and see the video play. No sound yet. Nope. There's no sound. I hear someone speaking, but I cannot hear him. There's no sound, uh, Marina. Okay. Let's... 
Can you guess here now? No, we see Luan speaking, but we don't hear anything. Okay, just give me a Maybe um, let's uh, let's just at least for this snippet. Uh, basically, on this interview, Luan, um, they are asking Luan um, what it was the, the measures of BAPS, and Luan is uh, replying with a few with a few measures that BAPS introduced it, and uh, then we have a question then for Luan. That's basically. Um, Okay, Luan, you're talking about measures that were implemented by BAPS in 2016. And my question to you would be then, do you think BAPS uh, finally presented solutions to those issues? Uh, what's, your, what's your perspective from uh, taking these measures from 16 to now? Do you think there was solutions to it? Uh, Luan, you're muted, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So the answer was no. Um, and that, 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 that uh, is something which uh, you can expect for me and also for other persons. Uh, the world is imperfect and BEPS is more imperfect than the world. I think that, that BEPS is a good uh, effort to, to, to curb some, some spectacular misuses in, in world taxation. And in that sense, the, they have enlightened uh, the, the, the different uh, escape ways that, that people and corporations took in order to, to avoid or to evade uh, taxation, uh, like the, the Paradise and the Panama Papers. These are exceptions. These are um, planning opportunities which may, mostly uh, uh, prominent individuals and corporations took in order to escape uh, fundamental taxation measures. And that cannot be approved anyway. But if we see to the 15 uh, actions of BEPS, they are in good faith intended to, to uh, curb uh, some, some misuses of some possible abuse or perceived abuses from especially corporates, big corporates. And maybe they did use that or misuse the law in order to, they did that, not for their own personal well-being, but for the personal well-being of, of all the stakeholders, the employees, and not only the shareholders, maybe in the past, but not now alone, the, 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 the employees, the, the, the suppliers, and, the, and the, the, the customers, that they can uh, have a level playing field, apart from playing in their, for paying in their option a reasonable, a fair share of taxation. And what is reasonable, what is fair share? I think that's something that philosophers have to decide upon and not so much as uh, tax uh, experts, but that's what they did. And maybe they want to, to went too far in certain aspects. So if uh, a corporate is paying no tax or even a limited taxation and 90% of its revenue is going to the the Marshall Islands to another sunny uh, place in the in the world, then we can imagine that in in a certain order of time there can be countermeasures uh, enunciated by the, by governments or on a supranational uh, level, and that's what happened now. So I am not against BEPS, but I think BEPS is only the beginning and is not sufficient. is is not complete. is not is not um, uh, the finished uh, picture uh, in order to uh, to address the tax abuses which have been committed. It should have been committed. And that's evidenced by the fact that it's ongoing now, that there has been 
explanatory notes in the years after BATS, after 2015 and 16. There have been uh, the pillar one and the pillar two. There have been um, NGOs who are struggling to, in order to, to, to thrive, uh, um, governments to, to go even further. There has to be, an, and that's pillar two, uh, a minimum taxation, because there should be a minimum taxation or alternative minimum taxation they used to call it in the, in the, in the older states uh, uh, tax system, uh, in order that, that that would be the, the natural state of affairs. Nobody can tell you what is a fair share taxation. No, we had in the Netherlands a uh, long time ago, an individual tax up to 70 or 73% of taxable income. That was based on a sort of ability to pay, uh, based on economic uh, uh, statements that people are able to, to, to uh, pay that kind of, of money because money is, has a deteriorating value to the measure in which you have it. That's the first, first law of cost. And if I, if I can recall it for my, for my uh, academic uh, uh, period, um, that's one percep perception, but it can also be another perception. You have the, 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 the corporation tax society, which is based on a sort of um, benefit principle or other principles with the uh, privileged uh, acquisition. Um, there are a lot of principles which can underlie taxation. But anyway, I think that, that BEPS has not reached the utmost uh, till this moment. And you see it now because in the, in the, on the verge of the BEPS uh, program, you have now the technology development, the algorithms and the, 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 the big data. And the, the, the data have to be data. You can have raw data and rich data, but anyway, data have to be cleansed. You have to be mined. You have to be store, stored, and, uh, and there's a warehouse for. And then you have to be apportioned. And these these things have are, are being reinforced by tax authorities, also by taxpayers. But tax authorities are trying to to um, encapsulate these these kind of main in order to to try to have a sort of, 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 of forensic uh, mentality to, to see where the real fraudulent or, or less taxation has taken place. And, and never, nobody knows where they are kept encapsulated in a an, in an, in an period of, of, of uh, indictment that they, they might have committed a fraudulent or for a forensic not, not correct uh, position. So that's very, um, um, yeah, frightening for for the for the for the citizen, and it's also crossing the rule of law in a democracy. So I think that BEPS has not reached its its utmost. It's going further and further, and it will go further and further again. Uh, we don't we have don't have to forget that BEPS, more ap apart from the um, actions. The, which uh, through uh, MLI have to be incorporated. Uh, it is self, soft law, it is still recommendation. And if for instance, uh, action two on the hybrids is to be, um, now action two should be in, incorporated, but if it is incorporated per country, it is incorporated in a different mode. So be it is tantamount to, to a lot of dispute resolution more than there is now. So the, 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 the pre predominant uh, principle is now that tax planning is being replaced by tax dispute resolution. And I think that is what we are looking forward to. Okay, thank you, Luan. Um, so I think uh, we have audio now. Question for Steve. Um, what are the economic reasons for a new uh, version of fair share uh, referred to as Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 blueprints? Uh, thanks, Anna. The, 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 the essence is here, if you look at the final reports of BAPS in, uh, in 2015, they basically took the road of where people are active, that's where the profit should be reported. Um, they did not, as, as Luan already indicated in the beginning, they did not find a good compromise for, for the tech giants who 
hardly have any, if if any, local presence um, in in terms of of people. So if you are not physically present in local countries and you are becoming a um, big tech giant uh, that allows you to bring all the profits uh, home and being allocated to the home territory. As a, as a consequence of BAPS, um, the uh, profit allocation uh, will be uh, moved um, uh, in favor of the home territory of that tech giant. So you saw a snippet of a Steve, um, and uh, Steve, I have a question for you based on what you say. You're discussing the economic reasons for pillar one and two, and based on the question that I addressed to Luan, I would like to address the same to you. Do you think BEPS presented final solutions taking into account these new initiatives on the digital economy? Um, thanks, Marina. The I think BEPS. Uh, as Luan said, uh, did, did close the back door. So uh, no leakage to uh, fancy islands or special structures, um, which, which got uh, abolished. Uh, what, what it didn't do, and that sort of uh, has been um, a history, OECD is uh, struggling with. Uh, I was in uh, Washington DC in 1997 when we talked about the international tax aspects of uh, e-commerce, it was called in those days. And then um, there was a conference in Turku in Finland uh, uh, where the OCD says, okay, let's let's take this, uh, uh, this up very seriously because maybe the international tax scene needs to uh, migrate alongside with these e-commerce type of models. Then it took them uh, till 2005 to issue a paper which said, okay, um, e-commerce is business as usual, so let's not do anything. Uh, th that was great but until uh, eight years later again, in 2013, uh, they came up with the BAPS uh, cycle of 15 reports. Um, it almost seems like uh, OECD has a pre-programmed eight-year cycle uh, because uh, now again, we, we know that the pillar one and pillar two will not lead to any final positions uh, in 2020, but rather in 2021, not very coincidental. That's again, eight years later. Um, um, so uh, we, we um, Luan and me have just uh, cleared an article uh, where we basically say, well, we hope, we hope that the OECD takes the, the next opportunity uh, in 2021 very seriously because uh, just thinking about how digital economy works and you've been doing that since uh, 1997, um, it's, it's quite a long time to get clarity on how to change the rules on international taxation. And the dilemma I see coming from, from uh, BAPS, which is very much uh, an OECD style where we say, okay, the business model and how economics are run defines how you get taxed in a territory. That's in essence, uh, so there's no tax reality which is different from a business model reality. Um, it's, it's a good starting point, but then the next question is how are you going to deal with uh, the introduction of uh, tax giants who through uh, platform economy business models uh, change the, the landscape of industries and, and how are you going to tax those? And, and indeed the, the pillar one and pillar two, but especially pillar one tries to give an answer to that question by saying, okay, if we can't use the normal rules on, on permanent establishment or simply because there's no people presence, we cannot allocate any profits to those jurisdictions. Why don't we... Uh, come up with a different model and the different model could be um, to um, take and that this is um, um, table 6.1 in the blueprint of, uh, of uh, pillar one. Let's take uh, any company who makes more than 10% profit before tax and assume whatever is in, 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 in access uh, that 
profit is what we call an excessive residual profit. And uh, we, uh, as, uh, as indicated in table 6.2, we're going to allocate 20% um, of that back to market jurisdictions where local actors are interacting with these platforms like users, internet service providers, uh, UPS, uh, the, the whole logistics, but also server parks. Uh, if, if that happens, uh, the, the, any company, and they, the OECD took a sample of 1,000 companies, they looked at their uh, country by country reporting, and they said, okay, uh, the profit of 1,000 companies who has the right uh, profile for this reallocation um, is, uh, is reporting $500 billion dollars Access profit. So that's the amount A under pillar. Uh, uh, on, uh, uh, that's the amount A under pillar one. Twenty percent of that is a hundred billion dollars, which is exactly what the Financial Times was uh, was highlighting as the to be reallocated to market jurisdiction um, uh, approach. So that here, what the OECD is doing is they try to um, repair the the two hundred. 50 pages on, uh, on, on the first BAPS uh, report uh, by, by saying, okay, anything in excess of 10 and 20% of that goes to the market jurisdiction. That's our resolution for digital economy. I think they're, they're failing in, in, in two aspects. One is um, the, the fact that a lot of countries come up with their own rules means the buy-in is relatively low. Otherwise, why would countries already compromise their position if, if they agree with this approach? Um, and second, uh, the, the second failure uh, is, is if you make a very, and table 6.1 and 6.2 in, in the blueprint of pillar one are a good, ex a good example of that. If you take a very uh, political, politically um, flavored, decision on what defines amount A uh, as, as, as tables 6.1 and 6.2 are doing, then you don't leave a connection uh, to the very economic reality uh, of, uh, of the BAPS report. So a lot of people will be lost in translation. Are we on top of the BAPS rules, suddenly having a very mechanical set of rules, which, uh, which we need to be using if excess profits come up in certain scenarios. So I think a lot of people are, are struggling with that very economic concept under BAPS and this very uh, mechanical way of allocating profits uh, through, through pillar one. Okay, thanks. Question for Steve. Yeah. Um, so what Question. Now we have a question to Hans actually. So I have a snippet here from uh, the interview. So what in your opinion is the legal base for pillar one and two? That's a simple one. There is no legal base. But going back to the background, the, the point is of course that the old system as, as Luan uh, mentioned, the League of Nations system 1933 I believe it was. Um, from that moment on, countries started to make agreements on how to deal with double taxation. Um, Hans, so uh, based on that, uh, you're mentioning that there is no legal system, there's no legal base for the pillar one and two. I would like to ask you, what do you think will be the impact on the EU? The impact on the EU? Um, well, actually, I think if you go to pillar one and pillar two, most important EU states favor pillar one as well as pillar two a lot. So if all the member states would agree, we could adapt like with ATAT one and ATAT two, where we adapted uh, the, the BEPS positions uh, officially in the EU system, we can do the same with pillar one and pillar two. I still hope, however, that we will be wise and that in both situations, specifically in pillar one, that we won't accept it as such without making sure that there's a mandatory dispute resolution system available. 
and that's not. However, if if we the European Union won't accept these rules, like Pillar Two, there are a few smaller Central European states which don't like it. If you if we won't accept these rules, then yeah, states go on their own. Italy, France, Spain, UK, by the way, also. Uh, in a couple of months, no EU anymore, but still. Um, and that's 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 even a worse issue because then we are sure that there will be double taxation. If so, if if we get pillar one without a mandatory dispute resolution, we might be confronted with double taxation. If we go for the unilateral way of like France and Italy and Spain and, and the UK want to do, then we will have issues with double taxation simply because they apply principles which deviate from the international tax treaty principles. And that's what I meant with no legal basis. So there will there is a need to create a new legal basis like we did with the BEP sections. That's actually, I hope, the answer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would just like to also introduce Kuntal. Kuntal is here uh, with us, and I would like to ask Kuntal from a non-EU perspective, so from an Indian perspective, do you think there will be any impact of Pillar 1 and 2 in India? So I uh, thank you, first of all, and it's a great privilege and honor to amongst uh, all of you for this uh, GTC virtual conference. And uh, I'm quite excited to be part of this discussion. And, and I agree to Hans when he mentions that there is no legal basis for Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. And that has been also recognized by uh, many countries, including India. And therefore, if I was to speak from the Indian jurisdiction point of view, uh, you know, we have seen that Indian government has uh, acted quite uh, proactively uh, because uh, unless and until there is a consensus and there is uh, acceptance to uh, maybe complicated set of rules to implement Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 with regard to digital economy, either by way of MLI or either by way of some other instrument. Uh, it's not going to have an illegal base. And therefore, Indian government has acted uh, proactively. And when I say proactively, I, uh, I'm referring to some of the amendments which have been carried out by Indian government uh, in the Indian legislation. If we recollect now that when the action plan one was released uh, way back in 2017, uh, there was uh, there were three alternative proposals which were considered uh, by OECD. Uh, and those three uh, alternative proposals were either to uh, go ahead with the SCP concept, which is significant economic presence concept, or maybe by equalization levy or applying withholding tax. Now, if we keep this in the background and also now refer to the uh, tax structure or the tax scheme of Indian jurisdiction, it provides that uh, you know, the non-resident uh, has the option to get governed by the taxing rule in India, either as provided under the provisions of Income Tax Act or as provided under the relevant tax treaty, whichever is beneficial to the non-resident. So if this is the background for the tax in India, I think uh, uh, what government has done is that they have introduced all the three concepts, not one, but all the three concepts. So we have an Indian Income Tax Act equalization levy. We have an in Income Tax Act, the concept of significant economic presence and, and the withholding tax uh, was always there as a part of the Indian legislature. So when we are now looking at a scenario, when you apply the income tax law so on a standalone basis, disregarding the tax treaty provisions, we have a, we have a situation where a non-resident would be subject to the equalization levy and also will be exposed to the rigorous tax provisions of Indian income tax law if the SCP concept was also introduced, was also was made applicable to such non-resident. And uh, therefore, if you also see that how this law and this provisions have been introduced in the income tax law. Uh, it has been provided that this particular equalization levy shall not be an income tax act. Therefore, the government has taken a position that it is not at all uh, disregarding its tax treaty obligation. They are saying it's not an income tax act. It's a special levy 
and therefore it is outside the treaty obligation and therefore it should hold good. And therefore we are now looking at a scenario where uh, foreign company, especially the digital economy and digital business are exposed to equalization levy as well as to withholding tax. And whilst we are at the, uh, this typical and very important taxing rule in India concerning non-resident where there is an option to get governed by the provision of the law or versus treaty, one would think that perhaps, you know, Vodafone could have adopted the whole structure, implemented the whole structure by adopting a jurisdiction, which was a treaty jurisdiction. Because if we recollect the structure, you know, there were layers of companies underlying the Cayman Island company. So if the structure was so executed that instead of selling the share of BVI company, which is a non-treaty country, if the share of Netherlands company or the share of Mauritius company was sold to achieve the desired objective of acquisition of Indian business, perhaps we would have seen a different uh, outcome to the whole controversy. So I just leave this thought uh, for all to consider that even though there is no legal basis, Indian government has introduced that particular concept under Income Tax Act. And today, as we speak, there is an exposure to foreign companies undertaking business with India on account of equalization levy. I hope this provides some feedback to you, to your question, Mirat. Thank you. Um, so uh, just coming back maybe to the dispute resolution side then, um, Hans, uh, regarding like dispute resolution mechanisms like APAs, MAPs or BAPAs, for example, and considering also the lack of mandatory arbitration under Article 4 of the Metal Tax Conventions, how do you think this would impact taxpayers' rights, this, this, all these dispute resolutions in place? Yeah. Well, yeah, it, 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 an APA is probably more an instrument to prevent that you will get in a dispute. I'm not fully sure whether that instrument is going to work for the Pillar 1, for example. Um, pillar three, 2 is a totally different system. So the, the only reasonable question is how will it be dealt with disputes under a new system? Um, a map is difficult because we are working in, 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 a, in a situation where more states are going to be involved. So arbitration would reasonably be the best solution. In an article which is on our website, Global Tax Machine website, I explained a little bit more about how I believe arbitration could be developed. Um, but it's, 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 it's going to be difficult. Um, I was reading a couple of days ago an article about arbitration in the non-tax issues and there and there you, you saw people from all the kinds of states around the world posting their position that arbitration is something for super states which gives away their sovereignty and that they will be left alone having no right anymore to decide on their own system so i have the strange idea that more and more states are actually uh, oppose arbitration as an instrument for, mandate, for, for dispute resolution than that they support it. And, and, and that's a terrible development. So again, because that would lead if they, the world still wants to continue with going to apply pillar one kind of rules, we will be in a war, in a tax war. And um, yeah, that's, that's not what I believe that would be the good way forward. We, we, the whole idea was to go to a more acceptable, justified system, reasonable allocation of taxing rights, et cetera, et cetera. That was the idea. But mainly, probably under the pressure of the NGOs uh, around the globe, um, you see a lot of developments where, where yeah, states just do not want to give in at any level. So if, even, for example, if a map would work, there's no possibility to guarantee that the map is really going to give a solution. Simply, the taxpayer isn't even a party in a map process. So 
No, I'm. Let me just say I'm quite negative about about uh, the dispute uh, position here. And again, the article I wrote where I also address the the uh, an alternative system for arbitrage is on our website. So if people want to know more, want to discuss it with me, be feel free. Thank you, Hans. Uh, we have a question from Martin. Um, he's asking if it's not also the key for pillar one and two, the additional tax to be levied in host jurisdiction, that they are credible in the home jurisdiction. Um, and then he asks a follow-up question, can there be any disputes resolution around it? Would you like to comment on that, Hans? Um, the, the second question I got, the first question is, again? Uh, is it also not the key for pillar one and two, that additional tax are levied in the host country, that they, are, they can be creditable in the home jurisdiction? And if so, there can, uh, is there any dispute resolution around it? Well, the point is that in, in a traditional transfer pricing system, um, you can via MAP procedure, of course, give in a little bit state A to state B, but the main issues here deal with underlying um, criteria being applied, whether there's a difference in, in as, for some, some elements it could be. It could be that some states would be willing to credit uh, a certain position, but the main discussions deal with amount A, B, and C. Steve mentioned a little bit about it and how to determine that one. In a situation where there is no agreement on how to provide these three, to the, these criteria to the three amounts, I don't think that the credit system is really going to solve this. Perhaps a, and, and yeah, I don't think there are many states which will unilaterally give away the possibility to tax or give a credit on, 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 on tax, which is not included in a tax base. So difficult, don't see that as, as an alternative. There the, the should be, because there is a lot of uncertainty, not just with amount A, B and C, but also with all the systems in, in, in the back and all the discussions going on and pillar two isn't easier. Um, I would say, let's just, make sure that we find a mandatory dispute system which works and then continue with system, uh, pillar one, pillar two, and not do it before. Yeah, okay, thank you. I think uh, uh, Luis, he's uh, making a good point here is that pillar one and two, they not necessarily deal with transfer pricing, they deal with the allocation of profits. So, um, He's irrespective of transfer pricing, so he's uh, just making this comment. I just mentioned it as an example that in a transfer pricing case, then a map procedure is easily more easily to work. That's what I said. So you can you can like state A can give a little bit and state state B can get a little bit, but it, it's it's different here mainly because there are many more criteria which play a role here. So that that's fully I agree with Luis here. Um, then um, for the panel discussion, we have uh, the last seven minutes here. I'd just like to address to all the panelists, so Luan, Kuntao, Hans, and Steve. Um, we see an increased use of data analytics worldwide by tax authorities. So tax authorities are leading the way. And um, do you believe that this can or is already hindering taxpayers' rights and their access to a fair process? What's your opinion around it? To whom was that question, Marina? Um, either you, Steve Kuntao, or Luan, to Sophia. To... We are going to discuss this more in the breakout rooms, but uh, I'm just bringing the question here about the increased use of tax technology by tax authorities and how this can impact or is already impacting the access to a fair process. Yeah, I, I, I just let me take a first step at this. If you, if you take... Um, data uh, and you define tax data on an international um, uh, level, which, which basically happened with the country by country reporting. Then you have your base platform for exchanging uh, data sets amongst governments. Um, that, that's the first statement. The second statement is if you start applying 
and collecting that data from various multinationals, as we I just mentioned, the uh, data uh, on the country by country 2016 reported by those 1,000 B2C tech giants, uh, as I mentioned before, then um, the tax policymakers are going to be able to um, analyze their tax policies and their effectiveness of tax policies on, on data sets. And, and you see that already happening in, in the blueprint of pillar one. If you zoom in to specific governments, I think uh, Luis is, is the more obvious uh, person to talk about that, but I, I guess the Brazilians are ahead of the curve. Right? They follow you from the, the moment a transaction creates a debit credit journal entry all the way to accumulated data sets, which hit the VAT return or a corporate income tax return. I think that's that's another way where the tracking and x-rays um, through software and, and for other means uh, tax authorities are putting on taxpayers uh, makes it a little bit, uh, the, 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 the world of big brother is watching you on a, on a real time base. Any thoughts from uh, from the others? Uh, I, 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 I agree with you, Steve, that uh, 1984 is uh, coupled with uh, the name of Kafka, eh? the, the, the government who is acting and you can't do anything about it uh, and towards it because it's an invisible, invisible, that do that these come to the front in, in the minds of people. And it is true that, that we are going that way because uh, uh, yeah, data mining and data combination, and yeah, the mo it can be a good thing in order to to um, uh, combat crime, uh, crime uh, investigation, or to 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 make crime investigation to a subset is all the more justified. But when it is used to monitor uh, citizens and to in intrude into their privacy, then it's uh, it's passing the, the 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 line, I think, and that's very. So we have to to make a, a charter in the first place, which is not in place anyway this moment, in order to protect civil rights again. So it's a sort of, a sort of a new uh, U.S. or French constitution, like uh, that, that that in order to, to protect taxpayer rights, uh, in order to to give them access to. Uh, to uh, procedure to 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 have to to filing a claim with a with a uh, tax court or whatever before we introduce the unlimited use of of data and data sets by governments and by other government like um, um, government like institutions. May I add something? Is that possible, Marina? Still? Yes. Please uh, go ahead. There is uh, fully agree with the previous speakers. There's also one other argument which we might forget about. That's a couple of years ago with my colleague Frank Herwald, who did the first uh, multilateral tax audit on transfer pricing, where in the past advisors worked together with the big four, for example, coming up with an excellent tax planning scheme for their companies. We see nowadays that tax administrations have the same way of being organized. They, they, they prepare a tax audit. And at the moment that the tax audit starts, four, five, six, or sometimes even more states have already developed a strategy which they use in that tax audit. And that's a very strong one, is my experience with the audits I did. Um, they know what happens in all the relevant states. They know exactly what they want to go for. And at the moment that you will be confronted with the fact that your company is going to be audited in such a way, um, it's zero one for the tax administration already. And, and that, that, that's, that's, that's the reverse position like in the past where the tax advisors were always ahead from the tax administrations which didn't co cooperate and coordinate anything. And that's also something together with the data, um, use of data, which, which is really a threat for companies if they're not prepared well for it. 
Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, Kuntal, do you want to add something else? Yeah, I think I fully agree to what previous speakers have said, and I just have two additional comments to what has been said already. One would be that we have uh, naturally identified the need to have a, a very robust and uh, a very smart uh, dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, there, in fact, we should also have, uh, you know, we, there's a general saying that uh, prevention is better than cure. So probably we need to have, you know, sound uh, tax policies. And uh, I agree to the suggestion of having a tax charter, uh, which would also in a way provide some kind of taxpayer some kind of rights, which can also help us achieve some kind of a reasonable approach and a fair approach to deal with so much of data, which is getting shared uh, with the tax authorities. A simple thing like, you know, data, whenever it is received by the tax authority should be always encrypted. So there is no unauthorized use. And in fact, there should also be provision that if there is an unauthorized use by the taxpayer, then there should be some action against the tax authorities. You know, such kind of some chartered uh, points can give some confidence even to business. Uh, when we talk about exchange of information, which uh, uh, Steph rightly mentioned, there should also be some kind of rights for the taxpayers. There should be a right to the taxpayer to get, you know, uh, a prior information, if at all any information about him is being sought from the third party, or if any information about him is being shared with the third party. And also there should be a right given to the taxpayer to to get to be heard before such information is exchanged. So there are many uh, important points which should be uh, uh, introduced uh, along with pillar one and pillar two, so that we have a fair and a balanced approach to deal with the whole equation of bringing to tax digital economy. Because fundamentally, I repeat that you know, prevention is always better than cure. So why do we have a dispute resolution uh, mechanism being worked out? Why don't we lead and uh, concentrate on, uh, on the action which gives rise to disputes and try and eliminate those issues?